This is me when I was 18 years old at Amsterdam Zoo. Throughout my childhood and teenage years, no day out filled me with more excitement and joy than visiting a zoo. But as I learned later, it turns out that zoos are actually not happy places for animals. Let me explain why. The term zoocosis refers to a psychological condition in which animals kept in captivity begin to display highly repetitive behaviors, such as pacing and circling, neck twisting, head bobbing, weaving and swaying, rocking back and forth, over grooming and self mutilation, as well as self induced vomiting and playing with excrement. The problem is, animals have evolved physically and behaviorally over thousands of years to become specifically adapted to their natural habitat. However, captivity is nothing like life in the wild. Animals in captivity have no freedom, no autonomy, and no agency. Their environment is forced upon them. Social interactions and circumstances are forced upon them. They have to continuously be in the presence of humans who may be loud who may bang on their enclosures, who may point at them, or in the case of a tiger at a London Zoo, may have beer poured on them by a drunk visitor. And to top it all off, they have no means of escape. They are literally trapped in these enclosures their entire lives. And if they do escape, they are often shot and killed, as was the case for two chimpanzees who were shot at a Dutch zoo in November 2020. The psychological impact of zoos is even acknowledged by the zoos themselves, with antidepressant and antipsychotic medicine use being well documented in zoos. In fact, a survey of every zoo in the US and Canada that housed gorillas revealed that half admitted giving pharmaceutical drugs such as Xanax, Valium and Prozac to the gorillas. The same kinds of drugs have also been given to other species, including bears, chimpanzees, zebras, wildebeests, orangutans, and also penguins in the UK. In the case of a female gorilla called Yahari, who continuously resisted mating with the male the zoo had placed her with, the zoo drugged her with Prozac so that she became unable to fend off the male. It's also difficult to fully know the true scale of the problem. As Laurel Breitman, the author of a book called Animal Madness puts it, at every zoo where I spoke to someone, a psychopharmaceutical had been tried. Clearly something is wrong here. Even if we just think about dogs, we view people who keep dogs locked up or who don't take them outside for walks to be dog abusers. Yet we lock up wild animals and confine them for their entire lives, but don't consider that to be abuse. Elephants are a notable example. In the wild, they walk up to 50 miles a day. Yet in zoos, these social and cognitively complex animals are confined in enclosed spaces where they can suffer from arthritis and joint pain. A study on African elephants showed that the average lifespan of African elephants in European zoos is less than 17 years, which is less than half the average lifespan of African elephants who are killed by poachers in the wild. And when the study looked at African elephants not affected by poaching, their average lifespan was 56 years in the wild, or more than three times as long as those kept in European zoos. In other words, our enjoyment at zoos comes at the expense of the sanity and well-being of the animals confined within them. Zoos have presented themselves as being essential to the conservation of endangered species, but is that really the case? There have been some cases of reintroduction of wild species using zoo animals, as was the case with the Arabian oryx. However, these examples are few and far between, and don't justify the confinement of every other animal species in zoos. After all, the captivity of elephants, lions, dolphins, and bears had no bearing on the success of the Arabian oryx reintroduction. And if we just consider that the majority of successful reintroduction programs are carried out by government agencies and not zoos anyway, then it becomes clear that the successful reintroductions only require targeted breeding programs for the critically endangered species that needed saving, not the existence of zoos. And it only goes downhill from here. Back in 2014, the world looked on in horror as a perfectly healthy giraffe called Marius was shot to death at Copenhagen Zoo. 
We all want to teach our children about the cycle of life and death in the animal world. But the Copenhagen Zoo may have taken this philosophy a little bit too far by putting down a perfectly healthy two-year-old giraffe called Marius, dismembering him in front of school children, and then feeding him to the lions. This giraffe walked out here at quarter past nine. It was let out into its yard over there. Then there was a zookeeper with some rye bread. It really likes rye bread, and he said, here you go, Marius, here is some rye bread. I stood behind with a rifle, and when he put his head forward and ate the rye bread, then I shot him through the brain. And he wasn't shot because he posed a threat to human life. He was shot because he was considered surplus. In other words, there were more giraffes at the zoo than the zoo wanted. A few weeks later, the same zoo then killed four lions, including two cubs, all because they wanted to make space for a new male lion they wanted to use for breeding. And this practice of killing healthy animals is not specific to just Copenhagen Zoo. In fact, it is estimated that every year, between three and 5,000 animals are killed by humans in European zoos that are members of the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums which is the organization that operates the European Endangered Species Program. For perspective, the EAZA only represents 8% of all zoos in Europe, so one can only imagine how many animals could be killed in the other 92% of zoos. And it's not just healthy giraffes and lions that are killed. Leopards, bears, tigers, hippos, lynx, elephants, and many other species have all been killed even though they were healthy. But why are zoos doing this if their intentions are to help with the conservation of endangered species? This problem mainly arises because of the captive breeding programs that take place in zoos. So if an animal becomes too old to be used for breeding, doesn't have desirable genes, or is taking up space from an animal that would be more profitable for the zoo, they are seen as disposable. And not only are healthy animals being killed in zoos, but other healthy animals are being taken from the wild. In 2016, 18 African elephants were captured from the wild and brought to zoos in the US. Dan Ash, who at that time was the director of the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the organization that approved the capturing of the elephants, is now the president and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, an organization whose members include those who received the wild caught elephants and state on their website that visitors can trust the AZA accredited zoos and aquariums are working hard to protect wildlife and wild habitat for future generations to enjoy. But how exactly? By capturing animals from the wild and locking them up in zoos where they have lower life expectancies. Ironically, the reason why elephants continue to be captured from the wild is because the captive breeding of elephants is so notoriously difficult, with low birth rates, and even when births are successful, there are problems with high rates of stillbirths, calf rejection, and infanticide, a disturbing and highly unusual behavior for elephants. In fact, captive elephant populations are actually actually in decline. It's estimated that for every new birth and captivity, two captive elephants die, and that the infant mortality rate for elephants in zoos is nearly three times what it is in the wild. In other words, rather than wild elephants relying on captive elephants to sustain their population numbers, captive elephants are instead reliant on wild elephants to sustain their population numbers. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, which is the organization that keeps track of the conservation status of animals more comprehensively than any other, state that they do not endorse the removal of African elephants from the wild for any captive use. And beyond all of this, it would be impossible to take many species of animals from zoos and place them into the wild because they would not be equipped to survive there. Plus, because of the decades of inbreeding, the animals can have wrong genetic profiles and be diseased, meaning that mixing these captive animals with wild animals from the same species could weaken the genetics of the wild populations. In the case of London Zoo, a study showed that two out of three lion cubs born there die because of the amount of inbreeding that has taken place. As one of the authors of the study put it, there are situations where they've bred the grandfathers with the granddaughters, 
This shows that the concept that zoos are conservation tools is completely false. This research blows that idea apart. Furthermore, it's estimated that 70 to 75% of species kept at European zoos are not threatened in the wild. And only 5% of mammals kept at the zoos are considered critically endangered, many of which are not able to be introduced into the wild anyway for the reasons just noted. So what are the conservation benefits of keeping animals that can't be introduced into the wild and the vast majority of which are not endangered in the first place? Zoos would argue that they donate money to conservation efforts. However, the Association of Zoos and Aquariums state that they have 200 million visitors a year to their accredited zoos and donate $160 million a year to wildlife conservation. This means that just 80 cents from every visitor is donated to wildlife conservation. In the UK, the British and Irish Association of Zoos and Aquariums state that they welcome 35 million visitors to their zoos each year, with 24 million pounds being spent on conservation per year, which means that less than 70 pence per visitor is spent on conservation. And this doesn't take into consideration the money spent in the zoo on food, drinks and merchandise from the zoo shops. In other words, donating one dollar or one pound to a conservation organization would contribute more funds to wildlife conservation than visiting a zoo. And it doesn't involve subjecting wild animals to a life in captivity and all the problems that causes. When London Zoo spent £5.3 million on a new gorilla enclosure, the chief consultant to the UN Great Apes Survival Partnership said, £5 million for free gorillas. When national parks are seeing that number killed every day for want of some Land Rovers and trained men and anti-poaching patrols, it must be very frustrating for the warden of a national park to see. And if we put this point further into perspective, Chester Zoo in the UK had an income of £47.4 million in 2019, which incidentally is about the same amount as the annual budget for the Kenya Wildlife Service. The Kenya Wildlife Service manages 27 national parks, 32 national reserves, and four national sanctuaries, four marine national parks, and six marine national reserves. In just one of their national parks, there are 1,600 elephants and more than 100 lions, as well as over 50 other mammal species. For reference, there are six elephants and three lions at Chester Zoo. Because of Kenya Wildlife Service's anti-poaching work, there has been a 12% increase in the number of elephants, rhinos, lions, giraffes, zebras, and antelopes since 2014. So the income of just one of the more than 300 licensed zoos in the UK could fund the annual budget of Kenya Wildlife Service. A great day's in store for everyone. Come to Chester Zoo and see. Zoos also argue that they serve to educate the public and inspire people to care about the conservation of the animals they see in zoos. But people have never seen a humpback whale or a blue whale in captivity, and yet feel no less strongly about their protection than the animals they see in zoos. When it comes to conservation education, nature documentaries can do that job without confining animals. Paul Boyle, the Senior Vice President for Conservation and Education at the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, said it best himself when he stated, People leave their homes and the intent is not to save animals in Africa, it's to have a family outing. At the end of the day, zoos are not built with the animal's best interest in mind. No matter how they spin it, the point of a zoo is to confine animals for human entertainment and profit. If we truly want to help animals while keeping their best interest in mind, we're better off doing things like watching nature documentaries, supporting wildlife sanctuaries and conservation organizations, and visiting state and national parks.